Good morning, good day, good evening, everybody, and warmly, warmly welcome to this fourth webinar in the Biodiversity Finance Mock Series. We will discuss um, the Biodiversity Expenditure Review in, in the webinar during the seminar. The structure would be a bit of an overview of the Biodiversity Expenditure Review according to the uh, workbook and then we go into the country examples. We will also listen to a country example which is from Bhutan uh, by Nawang and it's a very exciting example actually because it's one of the few studies that combine both climate and biodiversity expenditure review. Um, so that's um, a bit special. We will also listen to another country example uh, by Dr. Rachel Morrison from the University of Exeter who will uh, present um, uh, BER from Ireland. And this is the very first biodiversity expenditure review carried out or, yeah, carried out in Europe. So this is also a very exciting example of a country uh, implementation of a BER. Welcome both Nawang and Rachel, and I will present Nawang. Uh, so Nawang is a, um, uh, the National Biofin Coordinator for Bhutan. He is, uh, he, and he crafted this first um, BR, which is combines Biofin and the CPEIR, which is the Ki Climate, Public Expenditure and Institutional Review approach. Um, prior to joining UNDP, he worked for the Department of Forest and Park Services and the Royal Government of Bhutan. So he's a forester by training and he has over a decade of experience in Bhutan's natural resource management, protected areas, environmental policy development, conservation finance and community-based projects. Uh, he studied forestry in India and holds a master degree in mountain forestry from Boko University in Austria. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Uh, greetings from Bhutan again. Uh, last week uh, we recorded the 700 and 42nd bird species in Bhutan, the pied thrush, and this was just over a month after we recorded our bird species number 740 in March this year. Bhutan continues to delight ecologists, taxonomists, and biologists every season, but how much do we spend on one of the last biodiversity refugia in the world? Uh, if you recall my introductory presentation during week one, I mentioned that in the case of Bhutan, because biodiversity is considered a key ingredient to achieving happiness, Financing gaps is not because of lack of political will or lack of innovating policies, but rather due to other competing demands to sustain happiness in our country. Therefore, tools like Biofin and Biodiversity Expenditure Review helps understand spending trends and building better business cases for more resources. If you look at the Biofin processes, the Biodiversity Expenditure Review comes after the PIR. For Biofin Bhutan, we took a bold step in integrating Biofin and CPEIR processes. When SDGs were adopted, the Royal Government of Bhutan picked these three SDGs, SDG 1 on poverty eradication, SDG 13 on climate action, and SDG 15 on biodiversity conservation to demonstrate medium-term results. There are strong synergies between these SDGs. They are indivisible in nature, which was also confirmed through our policy and institutional reviews and we therefore took the opportunity to pioneer an initiative to combine biofin and CPEIR processes through an analysis of policies, institutions, partnerships, and a common expenditure review for biodiversity, climate change, and also linkages to poverty. We are happy to report that we now have an expenditure review framework adapted from biofin and CPEIR models and based on government's budgeting and expenditure review but our methodology is dynamic and we'll continue to undergo changes and modifications based on lessons learned and changing definitions and contexts. Uh, because of time limitations, I will not go into the details of methodology and all the results, but rather give you a brief snapshot of our approach and few results. But I want to spend more time today on sharing some key lessons through our processes which may be useful for many of you, especially the participants and also our new biofin countries. Just to give you a sense of our approach, in terms of selecting key sectors, we, uh, we, uh, we were guided by our policy and institutional reviews. We selected agencies that had direct and indirect relevance to 
of biodiversity or climate. So the primary level classification was more of looking at expenditures and shortlisting those that have some relevance to biodiversity or climate. The second level classification was to separate biodiversity expenditure attributable to either biodiversity or climate change, which was then classified under this third level of classification. And here we use biofin tools, which is in the workbook to unpack biodiversity expenditures into nine biofin categories. And similarly here, we used the CPEIR tool to unpack them into three climate expenditures. Then we had the fourth level, which was to assess how these expenditures actually contributed to poverty reduction goals. In the interest of time, I will not go into the details because I have more lessons to share and more on the parameters, attribution, tagging and weights will I think will take so, uh, so much of time, but I'll be happy to answer questions later. So if you look at the expenditure review, they can tell you many stories. For example, in the case of Bhutan, we could track the green sources of finance over last 10 years. So look at the spending capacity and efficiency of some of the sectors and programs and provide recommendations on how we can be aid effective or invest in some areas such as programs or capacity development. In, in, in the interest of time and also some data sensitivities, I'll share you some only few results. Here you can see the attributable expenditure as proportion of the government budget. As you can see, on an average, we spend around 5% on biodiversity and climate, which are more or less equally distributed among biodiversity and climate change. Similarly, we can also assess what proportion of government spending, uh, what proportion of spending is to countries' GDP, for example. Interestingly, if you look at how we related to the poverty reduction, both climate and biodiversity spending had high positive impact on poverty reduction with clear interventions on poverty either through direct or indirect contribution. So when you talk about biodiversity spending mostly on wildlife, wildlife conservation or species-based conservation, uh, it's interesting and positive to note here that we also have several livelihood uh, interventions which indicates uh, positive contribution of poverty uh, uh, of biodiversity and climate spending on poverty reduction targets. If you, uh, we are also able to track how much of the expenditures relate to uh, either domestic sources or external funding. For Bhutan, despite being an LDC and aid abandoned country, it is interesting to note that more than half of the funding sources actually comes from domestic sources, which is a testament of Bhutan's commitment to environmental conservation. So these are some of the stories that you can share and you know make uh, uh, the government uh, and public agencies proud. This is expenditure by nine biofin countries, uh, categories, sorry, which gives us picture of how spending is done across 20 IG targets and also informs policymakers to assess areas which need increased investments or opportunities for realigning expenditures. For example, if you can see here, areas such as biosafety and restoration are currently underinvested but may have huge potentials of avoiding future costs if you are able to convince your finance ministry to spend more on in these areas. Similarly, different categories of climate change under adaptation, mitigation, and adaptation and mitigation that we have used. However, climate change is quite complex, and here we can suggest that if these can be segregated further into not only to track um, targeted in, uh, uh, relevant targeted interventions, but also when you do your finance assessment. Then the, one of the final steps is based on the historical pro, uh, expenditures, how we project the future expenditures. Here we have done covering the next plan period for Bhutan up to 2022 and 2023, and also based on our policy and institutional review recommendations and going beyond the NBSAP. Uh, this is a business as usual scenario, which will later be used for our NBSAP exercises. Assuming that Jessica will present first, I have all the methodologies covered, but hopefully it will come back. And I'll go now to the challenges that we faced, which may be useful to some of you. Some of the challenges during carrying out of these exercises were, of course, to begin with, we struggled to have a clear approach to integrating climate and biodiversity. We had to deal with a huge volume of data. And even after selection of sectors and use different nomenclatures under biodiversity and climate change and dealing with 
lots and lots of inconsistencies in budget line items. And then there were some complex activities, including use of jargons in biodiversity and climate expenditures. For private sector expenditures, these were obviously difficult to obtain in the first place. But even after getting them, information were very broad and sometimes it was difficult for us to understand what the real spending was. Another challenge we had was to account for negative expenditures. For example, in our case, roads and hydropower development may account as negative expenditures. But when you look deeper, there are also some signs of positive expenditures within those. For example, plantation, CSR, green related initiatives, which I will cover as part of the lessons. As mentioned, we found it extremely difficult for us to relate to poverty expenditures, which is highly complex and multidimensional. Based on the comprehensive expenditure review process that we undertook, I'm afraid I was not very clear on the methodology, but as I mentioned, we'd be happy to share the framework and the approaches with uh, any interested country or participant here. Our approach was rather long, challenging and complex. So I want to share seven key lessons, some of which is mentioned in the workbook and other guides that you may see on expenditure reviews, <coughs> but many that we documented, hoping that it will help many of you, particularly new biofin countries and other agencies and participants or sectors who are interested in carrying out expenditure review. Uh, but let me clarify and mention here that the challenges that I'm going to talk about may be context specific and largely depend on the public financial management systems in the country. First lesson, do look at existing exercises such as the public environmental expenditure reviews done in the country, CPEIR processes done in the country. These will give a good basis to start. And even these, if these are not there, you can always look at other sectors. Example, health expenditure reviews. We usually get some good ideas of nature of budget line items, key assumptions that we can borrow, and even some of the common challenges that we face and how we address them. For example, in the case of Bhutan, our starting point was the public environmental expenditure review, which was already covered, which had already covered very important components, including broad classifications, budget systems, and more importantly, some key recommendations that we could easily follow. And like Bhutan, be bold to combine some of uh, the expenditures if they add value. And we also had a lot of cost savings, which I will share later. Lesson number two, do discuss, analyze, and decide how much time you should spend on the expenditure review. And this is quite important. In our case, we spent way too much time, mostly going rigorously through thousands of budget line items. And I think we should have a time frame ourselves when to complete based on the resources, affordability, and more importantly, its end use in the context specific scenarios that we are using. The policy and institutional review is a good starting point where you will get good ideas on which sectors to focus on, especially those sectors that spend on biodiversity. We usually select sectors based on our PIR analysis, and this saves us a lot of time, which brings me to my next lesson, lesson number three, which may contradict a bit, but nevertheless very important. While selecting sectors based on the policy and institutional review, some sectors which have limited spending on biodiversity may still have increased or very important role in future spending. For example, in our case, we had left out sectors such as health and municipalities for, uh, as, as case in example, because of their minimal relevance to biodiversity and climate issue today. But later we realized these sectors will have huge role in implementing countries NBSOP and the new nationally determined contribution to UNFCCC. Example, urban biodiversity, and also some other issues like uh, future climate change scenarios. Therefore, we had to take these additional sectors uh, uh, to be accounted for future. Number four, how to understand and interpret negative expenditures. In our case, we difficult to account initially. For example, as I mentioned, roads and hydropower construct constructions typically account for negative expenditures, and we would leave them out or account them accordingly. But when you talk to these sectors, there are positive expenditures too by these sectors. For example, we found that these road and hydropower sector, they do a lot of bioengineering works, interesting road restorations, which have plantations, and also they're focusing now on climate friendly ro roads and a lot of CSR on, uh, on biodiversity. Also, more importantly, their argument to us was that road construction and hydropower development may be negative spending now, 
But once complete, they will only benefit the environment, for example, through provision of clean energy, which reduces pressures on fuel load. And uh, as we know from forestry textbooks, road is a tool for forest management. So yes, do talk to them and understand negative expenditures from the spenders themselves. Uh, lesson number five, we tend to be quite mechanical while tagging and attribution, but don't judge the book by its cover. Be curious and suspicious on some attractive activities. There is a tendency for many sectors to use many jargons, which only confuses us. For example, if you see climate smart afforestation or climate smart agriculture, don't be carried away. Go deeper and look at their sub activities. Sometimes these are merely attractive project titles with only normal activities, and sometimes the activities have no relevance whatsoever. Uh, lesson. Lesson number six is very important to manage the risks of double counting right from the beginning. I think it's mentioned in the workbook, which will save us a lot of time actually in, uh, uh, while doing the exercise. Pick typical sectors which account for such negative, uh, such uh, possible of uh, double counting, especially the project holding sectors, subsidies, etc., and discuss with the stakeholders. You can list down the risks and use different principles, whether it's execution or financing principle. We found it most useful when we focus on execution principle, where we count on, on only at agencies which execute the activities, and that way it was much more easier for us to avoid the double counting. Final, final lesson, throughout the BER course, explore financing solutions instead of waiting for the finance, uh, final biodiversity finance plan. Many ideas on financing solutions are actually generated while carrying out an expenditure review. Typically, you'll see lots of options for realigning expenditures based on the current spending and initially understanding future needs. And as I said, there are a lot of challenges in private sector spending on biodiversity. But to us, some of them, they, don't, they do, do not spend on biodiversity because they lack ideas. So if you discuss with private sectors, you can actually come up with innovative financing solutions, such as projectizing their CSRs, giving them project ideas based on your NBSAP, NDC, etc. And of course, through the expenditure review, you will come across lots of capacity gaps and needs across institutions. It's very important to document them as they will form a major part of your next steps in implementing our financing solutions. With this, I come to the end of my presentation. As I said, we have had lots of challenges in completing an integrated approach to devising a common expenditure review for biodiversity, climate, and to an extent poverty. But we are happy to inform that we have now a local framework that can now track expenditures at any given point of time. Doing this, we have saved a lot of costs, both during the process and also in the future. We are happy to support new countries and institutions planning to carry out similar approaches, but of course it will depend on the local uh, systems and PFM systems. Uh, our local BioFin team were fully supported by the Ministry of Finance here, and we also acknowledge the contribution of uh, UNDP's climate governance team and the Archfile UNEP team in Bangkok. Thank you, and uh, I'm happy to listen to questions. So now, thanks a lot for this present, uh, presentation. It was uh, great to hear and see the experience from Bhutan. So I'm Marco Arlo, I'm an environmental finance expert working for the global team project management, but also the technical part. Um, now I'm going to present the methodology part. Um, so first of all, I saw in the attendees that we have some uh, actually Spanish speakers and French. Uh, so one information for everybody is that actually the French and Spanish workbook is now available online. So uh, if you feel more at ease with uh, um, the, the reading the workbook uh, in French or Spanish, please feel free. Um, another uh, thing I wanted to remind, uh, I think everybody saw that this week biodiversity finance was everywhere in the social media, the IPBS uh, report that went out. So I would encourage actually everybody to go take a look at it. Um, and you will see the importance, uh, the, the critical importance of biodiversity finance nowadays. So to come back, to the, the subject we're here for, so the biodiversity expenditure review. Um, so just a small uh, step back on where is the biodiversity expenditure review in our methodology. So here is a graph that we're going to see all at every webinar to try to understand a little better how all the, the pieces of the biofilm methodology come together. Um, so first, we have those three uh, assessments, the policy institutional review, the biodiversity expenditure review, and the financial needs assessments. Uh, so the policy institutional review is what you heard about last week in lesson three. Uh, 
This week, we're seeing the Bytercity City expenditure review, so how much is spent for Bytercity. City. And the next week, you will have the financial needs assessment, how much is needed to reach the national Bytercity City targets. All these assessments allow to feed in a Bytercity City finance plan. So one important key aspect here is that we need recommendations from each one of these assessments because they will feed into a Bytercity City finance plan, into the selection of finance mechanisms to then being able to, to implement those, um, those finance um, solutions. So what's the objective of the BER? The objective of this BER is to help understand how much money is spent for biodiversity uh, outcomes, by whom, and whether aligned uh, with national biodiversity objectives. The overall objective of, of the BER is to use detailed data on, from the public sector, but also, and this we will Come back on it private and civil society budgets um, also we will see the importance of differences between allocations spendings and budgets um, and all this data collection uh, and analysis of data will aim at finding recommendations for policy and finance solution development so here are these different points you can see one two three four five six uh, are the main things that um, the main parts that the Bytes expenditure review should have. Um, so first, uh, of course, um, you need to, 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 to have the basics of who is uh, spending the money and what type of actions are doing. Uh, then to, uh, to link those spendings to uh, various categories that we're going to see uh, just after to, to tag these expenditures to, to some classification then um, to see the, the alignment of these expenditures with the, the, the government priorities, um, as well as um, the, the delivery patterns. Here, the aim is to understand um, what is the delivery rate of, of, uh, of the expenditures. Uh, are, do we have only data for budgets? Do we have only data for allocation? Or do we also have data for actually expenditures? Those are not the same numbers often, as we can see in the, in the, in the countries. Um, then the, 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 the financing uh, sources, so if there are uh, some revenues that the government received from nature-based uh, sources, um, as well as future spending, trying to understand, okay, if we follow these steps, uh, the, the same uh, scenario we're in now, those are the expenditures we think uh, will happen in the next years. So here, um, are the four, sorry, five different steps that the BER uh, needs to follow. Uh, so those you saw them in the lesson you're currently following normally. Um, so the preparation, the, um, defining the, the, the main parameters of it, so the, the definition of the various expenditure, um, establish the, the classification systems that will be used, as well as this is something we're going to focus actually during this webinar. Um, what is the, uh, how are you doing the attribution, um, the coefficient attribution to understand exactly how much is spent for biodiversity? I will come back on it a little later. Um, so uh, then, of course, tagging biodiversity expenditure. Once we understood all those parameters and we prepared for where to find the uh, data, whom to address, then we go to the data collection. Again, here something important: we go for public, private, and civil society. Um, then, of course, we move towards data analysis. The hypothesis is not just to have uh, uh, to have a lot of data. Out of this data, an analysis needs to come uh, to come to see um, uh, to compare this data to national context, to national budget, um, etc., and trying to see what are the priorities that can come out of this. And finally, projecting the, the future expenditures. So first of all, defining uh, the, the main parameters. So, <clears throat> sorry, uh, here, um, James, to first to define what is the biodiversity expenditures. This is something actually that needs to be clear with all the stakeholders you're gonna talk to. Um, it can be sometimes easier with the public sector, but for example, with the private sector, it's extremely important to have a clear definition of what is a biodiversity expenditure. So here, the, the biofin definition for it is any expenditure whose purpose is to have a positive impact or to reduce or eliminate pressures on biodiversity. Once you have the definition of biodiversity expenditure, the aim is to establish a system for the attribution of primary and secondary um, expenditures. So 
if you um, add uh, the, the time to look into um, this uh, particular subject in your lesson, you will have seen that not all the expenditure, environmental expenditures are uh, benefiting biodiversity. Some environmental expenditure could be, for example, let's say building a solar farm to reduce the CO2 emission. It has an indirect effect like some biodiversity. However, the expenditure here is not aiming at protecting or storing uh, any biodiversity um, uh, program uh, or having any biodiversity outcome at first. Then you can have also other actually climate expenditure, for example, as replanting mangroves. Here we will see that there is a secondary obje uh, objective which is related to biodiversity. It will have uh, a positive effect on biodiversity. And then you can have primary expenditure, which are, for example, extending the protected areas. This for sure we know will support the biodiversity expenditure. Oh, sorry, the biodiversity expenditures. Um, so on this type of expenditure, we will put a coefficient of 100%. On the other one, secondary one, uh, we will put from 0 to 100. Uh, sorry, it's from 0 to less than 100, of course. So 0 to 75, for example. This will be also something that you need to establish, a system of attribution. Some countries used um, agency approach. Some countries used uh, the program approach. So this, uh, uh, I think, in the next slide, yes, for example, here we have the program approach, which is used by Kazakhstan. This is the one that we advise to use. Um, it depends a lot of the data that is available in the country. Um, for example, uh, for Philippines, they use an agency approach. So in the Department of Environment, you have a lot of agencies, and each agency had different level of um, biodiversity expenditures, different coefficients were attributed to them. An agency was specializing on biodiversity. So after um, a deep research on understanding um, the main activities of this agency, the, the team was able to put a coefficient, for example, of 80%, um, while um, uh, another uh, agency was more focusing on climate change. So this one had a much lower coefficient. The aim is to understand how much is spent in biodiversity. In this one of Kazakhstan, they're using a program activity. The difference with the one I just explained from Philippines, the agency uh, expenditures, is that here we go even more into detail to go to the program activity of each one of these agencies. So this is possible when you have the data. If you don't have the data, you still need to find a way to have an expenditure so you can go to the agency level. But the program level allows to go even more deeper uh, in the analysis of how much is spent for biodiversity. Here you have um, this uh, on the left, the, the, the arrows that shows from direct to indirect expenditure and the different coefficients are used, as well as some examples. So here you see um, increasing uh, water av uh, availability, for example, for this uh, program, the, the country team selected to decided to put 5%, uh, which means that 5% of this program is actually contributing to biodiversity outcomes. So this is really important to understand how to, um, to um, attach coefficients to, to the different expenditures. Here are the classifications, uh, the, the nine biofin categories that actually biofin is uh, providing. Um, so that are compared to uh, six IG categories. So to each one of these expenditures can be actually tagged with one of these biofin categories. Um, you might have to use also other classifications. Uh, they are not completely, um, if you use this one, it doesn't mean you cannot use others. The aim is to have at least the understanding of each expenditure in, first, in function of clear categories. Uh, and here, for example, Colombia had an example where 36% was going to uh, protection, while 41% was going to restoration. Uh, and so this is extremely import important to understand where is this spending going in the biodiversity um, uh, categories. Now, uh, here we have the example from Guatemala and Fiji. So Guatemala here, um, they, 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 they showed the result they had uh, with the, the, the distribution of the expenditures. They had the possibility to see expenditure from private sectors, donors, NGOs as well as public sector. Of course, as you can see, public sector is uh, 
always much more important. Um, then on the top, we can see the um, graph from Fiji, where uh, we have uh, expenditures in function of categories. Uh, for example, uh, you can see coastal management, uh, invasive species management, um, etc. So this is an example of some uh, results that can come out of, um, uh, of the BER. Now, just uh, this is the, the model outline of a BER report. But just before that, I will come back. I would like to come back to some key results that you, you should that should come out of biodiversity expenditure review. For example, once you have all this data, you need to convert to macroeconomic uh, numbers. Uh, for example, we saw that usually in our countries, between 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 percent of the GDP was going to biodiversity expenditures. 0 0.2 to 1.8 percent was going to the national uh, uh, of the sorry 0 0.2 uh, or uh, between 0 0.2 and 1.8 percent of the national budget was going to the biodiversity uh, expenditures. So here there is the importance to understand even for example if the biodiversity uh, expenditure increased, did it increase compared to the national budget? All of these numbers are really important, and of course, they will change in function of your country. If you have a country of 150 million people, if you have a country of 100,000 people, uh, of course, the, the, the numbers will change, and you need to understand these numbers in function of the national context. Another example uh, that was found uh, by Guatemala was that 7.5% was spent by municipalities, while 92.5% was spent by national government. So here they, they saw that there was a, a big necessity to improve the spending from the municipalities toward biodiversity. So they developed uh, a finance uh, solutions that allowed five municipalities to increase their budget uh, and their uh, future spending for um, coastal restoration. Um, so this is, for example, from this analysis, we can understand which type of mechanism after. Another example is the dependence to ODA. In some countries, the biodiversity depends at 70% of ODA. But if there is an external, an external shock, a, an economic crisis that will reduce a lot of the ODA, then we need domestic mechanisms to be able to support this biodiversity. So here again, if we see a big, a big dependence from ODA, then we need to uh, create um, domestic mechanisms. You can see also synergies between finance uh, and biodiversity, uh, sorry, between climate and biodiversity finance between recurrent expenditure and infrastructure expenditure. We see that a lot of time, biodiversity expenditures are more related to recurrent expenditures. And however, if we want to improve our biodiversity outcomes, we need to invest also in, uh, in infrastructure. Uh, and of course, one thing important um, is to see the difference between budget, allocation, and expenditure such. Sometimes this data is actually not available and you will need to go to the budget level. But a lot of the, uh, most of the time we see that there are capacity issues, absorption issues. Sometimes the budget, once we succeeded to have a, a large budget, it's great, but we realize that actually there is a lack of capacity to spend it. So the delivery rate is extremely important as well. <clears throat> so without uh, going uh, further, uh, we're going to switch to Rachel. Uh, Rachel, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, you're one of the first um, uh, developed countries who did the biodiversity expenditure review. This is really exciting for everybody. And I'm sure that this uh, IPBS report will, um, will lead the way and help uh, and give incentives to other developed countries to actually push for uh, a biofin methodology implementation and a BER. So Rachel, uh, I leave the floor to you. Thanks again. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Rachel Morrison. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher working on conservation finance at the University of Exeter. Um, between 2016 and 2017, I developed and implemented um, the first National Biodiversity Expenditure Review for Ireland with um, Craig Bullock at the University College Dublin. And very much um, this work was done in partnership with the Irish National Parks and Wildlife Service and the Irish Research Council. As part of the project, we used the Biofin methodology to provide the framework for tracking and analysing biodiversity expenditure across the Irish public, private and non-profit sectors. In this presentation, I'm going to try to sort of run briefly through um, Ireland's um, motivation for carrying out a biodiversity expenditure review, our experience um, in using the Biofin methodology and some of the challenges and results and, and impact that this process um, has had.
Um, so I'll just click on to the next slide. Um, so firstly, just a little bit of context about, about Ireland. Um, Ireland is often sort of stereotyped as the green and present, pleasant land and, and referred to as the sort of Emerald Isle. Although it's probably not, um, not the hotspot of biodiversity, it does have a very um, good diversity of habitats given its size, with particular importance for wetlands, um, coastal habitats and peatlands. However, much like the global situation, um, Ireland's biodiversity is very much in trouble. Um, in common with other countries, biodiversity decline is being caused by habitat loss, land use change, agricultural intensification. Um, so there are a number of um, studies uh, which report on Ireland's biodiversity trends and um, the um, majority of Ireland's most important um, ecosystems is our sort of most protected sites. Um, one study found that some 91% are classified as in bad or inadequate status using the EU definition of good conservation status. Um, the loss in bees and butterflies is also occurring sort of in a faster rate in Ireland than in the rest of the world. And we're seeing that once commonplace species are increasingly in danger of local extinction, such as the corn crate curlew and the yellow hammer. The government department responsible for turning around these worrying trends in Ireland is the Irish National Parks and Wildlife Service, or the MPWS, which operates under the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Galtech. The National Parks and Wildlife Service really manage Ireland's network of national parks. They coordinate the delivery of the National Biodiversity Action Plan and are responsible for the enforcement of conservation legislation and the designation of protected sites. As an EU member state, um, Ireland's nature conservation policy is also very much driven um, by EU's directives, such as um, the Birds and Habitats Directive, which they report under, as well as um, the CBD um, reporting framework. Um, so why were we interested in finance? Although Ireland is, is not a biofin country, um, securing resources for biodiversity is a major challenge for every country and Ireland is really no exception. But there are a number of sort of critical drivers for, for Ireland in, in wanting to um, engage with the biodiversity expenditure review process. Um, firstly, as Marco outlined um, in the main presentation, I think, um, before we start sort of thinking about mobilising finance, one of our key most favorite is that we really need to know about the current distribution and effectiveness of financial flows for conservation. The Biodiversity Expenditure Review for us really provided um, a baseline and informed platform for thinking about strategically mobilising biodiversity finance. It was an opportunity to really understand sort of the landscape of biodiversity finance, its sources, drivers, dominant players, um, and threats and opportunities, and really to understand whether new sources of finance were going to be needed or whether existing um, finance would, could be used more effectively. The National Parks and Wildlife Services is quite a small department, it's often underfunded and with um, significant responsibilities. Although they had a really um, good general sense of, of what was being spent on biodiversity um, and the major sources of finance, this sectoral knowledge was actually quite um, distributed and, and there was no real national overview or, or at a really detailed scale and high resolution to really understand how the flows of finance um, were, were really um, occurring in Ireland. Um, and particularly those flows which exist outside of the remit of the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, so this uh, biodiversity expenditure review really um, represented for them a platform to think more strategically and to develop a more strategic position in, in thinking about um, finance and to foster dialogue and discussion with other departments who may have um, bigger budgets for, for conservation. Um, in addition, um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service recognise themselves um, and the conservation sector are not particularly well versed at the moment in the language of finance or in financial planning. And um, this represented really a, a, a chance to get to grips with this new language of conservation finance and a platform to inform their perspective on um, resource mobilisation. Uh, the Biodiversity Expenditure Review was also seen as a tool for sort of advocacy and accountability. The public sector in Ireland has been through a series of public expenditure review cuts since the 2008 economic crisis and this was really an opportunity that they, they hoped to shine a light on the underfinancing of biodiversity and make this um, much more visible to policy makers. Um, indeed, when the results of the National Biodiversity Expenditure Review came out, one green news outlet used the review to highlight that um, the uh, horse racing board in Ireland receives actually about uh, six times uh, the amount of finance as the National Parks and Wildlife Service. So it was the opportunity to give for the first time very clear numbers on biodiversity expenditure uh, and start talking to the people who are, who are in control of, of these flows of finance and, and sort of empower the National Parks and Wildlife Service. So um, that's just a bit of a, a brief um, overview of, of why they wanted to undertake 
um, a biodiversity expenditure view. Um, and now um, I wanted to, to start talking about uh, what we really did. So uh, the aim was very much to provide a much more comprehensive understanding of the landscape of biodiversity finance in Ireland, um, a baseline from which to think much more strategically about resource mobilisation and realignment. To achieve this, what we wanted to undertake was a very systematic and critical view, a review of the flows of biodiversity finance within Ireland's public, private and non-profit sector. Essentially, we wanted to move from the very basic understanding of biodiversity expenditure and the schematic on the screen to a much more um, detailed understanding of the flows of finance. Um, and a much more comprehensive one. And the map on the slide um, is just a very early schematic that we did to try and map out um, through, through undertaking this process some of the different um, programmes that we've identified as relevant to biodiversity expenditure. My role in the project was very much to develop the methodology um, and to, to find us a methodology that was going to work effectively and to collate and analyse the data. In looking and undertaking a biodiversity expenditure review, we found that was really sort of at that time when I was doing this, which was sort of 2016, there was no internationally agreed methodology um, and no sort of common methodology which other EU member states were, were applying. Um, instead, um, different states were sort of um, very much doing their own thing um, and defining biodiversity expenditure quite different, differently. However, we found the, um, the very lucky that the Biofin team produced their um, workbook in, in 2016, and it really provided a very um, systematic, replicable and defensible framework for undertaking a biodiversity expenditure view. So we adopted the Biofin methodology as the basic framework um, with some scope for local adjustments and adopted a study period stretching from we wanted to collect data from 2010 to 2015. So, even though the um, Biofin methodology provides a really clear framework and methodological approach to follow, and which was really well um, outlined by Marco, there were still a number of challenges in implementing any national biodiversity expenditure review. Um, and hearing from the Biofin countries over the last few webinars, I think that we faced many of the similar challenges um, in undertaking the review for Ireland. Um, one of the primary um, initial challenges is setting out what's really going to count as biodiversity expenditure and what to count. Essentially, this is setting out the scope of your review. Even with the definition set out by Biofin, um, the remit of biodiversity um, sort of setting out the, the boundaries of, of your biodiversity expenditure review can still be quite challenging, as different stakeholders can have very different opinions on what should be included as positive action for biodiversity. And the definition that you adopt will make a really um, significant difference to the figures that you report. As part of researching the methodology, I looked how, at how um, biodiversity expenditure was um, de defined by different countries. And if you look at sort of early attempts to do this um, pre sort of biofin um, in Switzerland, Canada and the UK, they all define biodiversity expenditure slightly differently. So the Swiss include very much expenditure on museums and education and the UK that they're, they're not really including museums and education. And also they're not they're not really including um, national parks, which is much more of a sort of landscape designation. And recreational de designation in the UK. This led to very different outcomes and meant that, that different figures produced by different countries are really um, uh, working off very different frameworks. For the purpose of our review, um, we really had to think about what was the core that we wanted to achieve. Um, we really wanted to map out the landscape of biodiversity finance in Ireland and therefore we wanted to adopt a, as broad a possible practical definition to, to ensure that we really understand the full landscape of biodiversity expenditure. And a restrictive definition may not have served this purpose and potentially have been in exclusionary. We found that taking a relatively flexible and open view to this defini a definition um, allowed us to start conversations with departments and engage people on, on why or, or why not their, their expenditure may not be um, suitable to include in the review. So we were able to start a lot of discussions um, with the department by um, being relatively open about, about this perspective on, on biodiversity expenditure. Um, as with other countries, there were very, also very difficult discussions about environmental protection expenditure and in the end we um, defined it slightly um, differently and kept it separate from the biodiversity expenditure, but we still acknowledged that, that environmental protection activities such as um, wastewater treatment, waste collection are likely to have a positive effect, although we didn't include them or classify them as biodiversity expenditure. Um, taking a broad definition um, meant, as, as, I, as you saw in the schematic um, on the last um, screen, we had a, a huge potential um, to include a, a range of different 
programmatic expenditures. Um, so the use of the coefficients, um, the programmatic coefficients set out with Marco was really very valuable for, that, for us um, in enabling us to distinguish between much more relevant biodiversity expenditures, such as expenditure on national nature reserves, on the reintroduction of species, um, and also um, much uh, less sort of um, less relevant or, or programmatic expenditure, which has multiple objectives, including um, some relevance to biodiversity conservation, um, such as the creation of sort of um, gardens with some biodiversity interest, but also might be primarily for recreation. Um, so although using the uh, coefficients can be slightly time consuming um, to carefully consider each of the programs, it's really, really valuable in terms of the quality of the data that you can produce. Um, but they can also be controversial, especially when you get down to the lower relevance, um, relevant percentages. So you get down to this sort of 5% of, of, of some, some small or minor relevance um, to biodiversity conservation, but they can also often encompass um, some very high expenditure programs. So you can and, um, end up in a situation where some very um, high spend but low relevance um, programs are, are shaping the final figures that you're producing in terms of, of the output of your biodiversity expenditure review. Um, much like defining expenditure attributing and tagging process, so this is against the sort of national biodiversity action plan targets and also the ACACHI targets, um, can be quite difficult um, as um, as you, you're probably all very aware, most biodiversity expenditure programs are, are designed to hit multiple targets. Um, so um, we ended up adopting quite a neutral tagging system um, based on the sort of common international classification of um, conservation actions before we tag them against um, Irish National Biodiversity Action Plan. Of course, um, I think uh, as a, a Bhutan example was really saying, obtaining programmatic level data can be really difficult and um, can be quite time consuming, um, especially I think in the conservation sector, um, they're not really accustomed to talking about finance. So this is a bit of a paradigm shift going on for them at the moment, um, which is really highlighting the value of courses such as these. Um, finance is often also scarce, scarce and can lead to sort of quite difficult conversation. So we had to be very clear in communicating what we were undertaking and why it was critical. Collaboration was also really, really key um, because of the scale of the review, it spanned um, multiple departments and it can be quite daunting, but we found that utilising really existing net networks um, for conservation, such as um, Ireland has an interdepartmental working group on biodiversity, um, an Irish environmental network and a, a national biodiversity forum, they were really, really crucial to us to tap into these existing networks of, of contacts um, to sort of um, kickstart um, our biodiversity expenditure review and, and really uh, engage with critical partners. And of course, um, there, there is also the problem of, of sort of tracking complex combinations of conservation finance, which can um, uh, consist of um, combinations of public NGO uh, and private expenditure. Okay, um, so just to quickly move on to the results before I take up too much time. Um, so what did this exercise really show um, and what was the impact uh, what was the impact of the results? Through completing the biodiversity expenditure review for the first time, um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service were able to finally put a figure on how much was being spent on, on biodiversity in Ireland. So that was around um, an average of 250 million euros per year um, over the six year study period. Um, the, even with just sort of this an initial figure and headline finding and without being able to do a financial needs assessment, which was very much um, the next stage for Ireland, we were already able to get some impression of, of the situation for conservation finance in Ireland. So we looked at biodiversity expenditure as a percentage of GDP. And that really showed that Ireland was only spending about 0.13% of equivalent to, to GDP on biodiversity. Um, and com in comparison, the IUCN has really advocated, sorry, that's the International Union for Nature Conservation, and advocated that OECD countries should be spending about 0.3% of their GDP on um, biodiversity. So we were already, even just from the headline findings, seeing the need potentially for a threefold increase in funding. Um, the study also really made clear the extent of the dependency on state-led finance in Ireland, in that although we were um, exper 
we had a really high percentage um, of state-led finance. So we found that around 97% of all biodiversity expenditure um, was coming from the public sector. Um, and this really sort of showed how far we need to go in terms of introducing new sources of finance and sort of private sector and, and uh, non-profit um, finance in Ireland. Um, so not only do we find that Ireland's biodiversity expenditure is very state-led, but it's also very much dominated by one department, and that's the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, who are responsible for some 78% of all expenditure. And this is a department whose um, remit is not nature conservation. And for comparison, the National Parks and Wildlife Service only compound about 9.9% of the total spend. Um, also, as you can see, so the map on the on the right, it maps um, uh, all the different departments that we have and sort of sources of finance on the left against the National Biodiversity Action Plan objectives. And what it really shows is how the, the sort of influence of, of the dominance of agriculture, so that's the DAFM, or the Department of Agriculture, um, Food and the Marine, and how that's really influencing which of the National Biodiversity Action Plan's um, objectives are being um, financed. So we can see a huge amount is going to National Biodiversity Action Plan Objective 4, which is about um, conserving and restoring um, commonplace and, and terrestrial um, biodiversity, not the protected sites and species, um, uh, and freshwater ones. In comparison, if you look at National Biodiversity Objective 5, which is the one just below that, this one focuses on um, conserving and restoring um, a marine biodiversity. And I think the scale is, is very obvious from that diagram. And we, and we were able to look into this in a bit more detail during the review. We found that just 1.3% of all sort of finance on biodiversity um, in Ireland goes towards the marine sector. And to put that in the context, um, Ireland's marine territory is some 10 times larger than its terrestrial territory. So we were really um, easy to sort of start pulling out some quite impactful statements just from the very early stages of the biodiversity expenditure review. Um, so really showing the dominance of agriculture. Um, the high percentage of government funding also emphasised and highlighted the lack of the resources coming through from the public and philanthropic silent sources. So we really turned our attention to look at, at why this was so low. And we found that environmental NGOs in Ireland are really heavily reliant on national grants, with 50 to 70 percent of their income coming from through government grants. Um, they really weren't uh, making up a particularly significant um, uh, percentage of the voluntary sector in Ireland, under 1% was coming uh, through for these environmental NGOs. And this really high re reliance on um, government finance um, was leading them very open to sensitive and economic, economic fluctuations, such as the recession which hit Ireland in between 2008 and 2013, which corresponded to a loss of sort of 52% of full-time staff in the NGO sec e NGO sector in Ireland, so that's the environmental NGO sector, and a drop of 48% in capital investment. So um, by looking into to what some of these figures were showing us, we were beginning to see that, that um, so and find some really sort of impactful outcomes just from, from scratching the surface of this review. So I'm a bit conscious of time, so I'm going to skip on um, before I tend to take up the whole of the webinar um, and just talk about sort of how we were able to use the trends over time figures. So the, the graph um, on the slide just shows um, expenditure trapped by sort of um, broad um, conservation actions. This is very simplistic um, classification of, of how expenditure was being used, but you can see this, um, this big drop in finance between um, 2010 and 2015. And we really wanted to understand what was the causes of the variability. So not only were we seeing a decline um, overall, but between 2000 and 2012 and 2013, there's a drop of about 100 million in magnitude of, of expenditure. And we wanted to understand this situation. Um, so some of this is very much the legacy of the, uh, the 2008 economic crisis, but the majority we found really reflects the cyclical nature of EU funding under the Common Agricultural Policy. So this is the funding for agri-environment schemes. And um, the 2012 to 2013 period um, is actually the switchover um, it, between um, the Common Agricultural Policy's funding cycle. So they have a 2007 to 2013 funding period, and then they switch into a new seven-year funding period. So we were able to see See that, that some of this variability was because of um, the setup of different financing actions. 
Um, but what we also um, were able to understand is, is that we needed to be cautious about just focusing on the quantity of finances available and not thinking also about effectiveness. On the surface, this, um, this graph is quite, is quite a negative graph. It's, it's suggesting that we're really um, showing a decline um, in biodiversity expenditure, and this could be hugely impactful. Um, but when we looked into sort of the agricultural spending, what we saw was that there was actually a shift in, in the type of agri-environment schemes that were being um, financed. So um, from 2010, 2012, we had this um, quite a, what you describe as a broad and shallow environmental agri-environment scheme um, called the Rural Environmental Protection Scheme in Ireland. And it had a really high level of farmer participation, but it didn't really demand a lot from them. It was very much a sort of whole farm approach and relatively shallow. Um, whereas after 2013, um, the Department of Agriculture um, brought in um, a much more targeted, much more species driven, much more action orientated approach, but it had a very much lower budget and uptake, but was arguably actually a bit more effective for conservation. So um, the important here, thing here is that the amount of biodiversity doesn't really say anything about how effectively that finance is being used. And it's, to, it's really important not just to, to look at the numbers, um, but to understand uh, the sort of schemes and the programs behind them, which just the quantities don't tell you. Um, we also were very quickly able to use um, the biodiversity expenditure view as a tool for advocacy. So um, the, the final graph here just so shows um, biodiversity expenditure um, on the core departments for nature conservation. So this is the Natural um, Parks and Wildlife Service. And we were able to show the sort of the real um, impact that the 2008 financial crisis has had um, and how um, they, they had been sort of really uh, and indifferentially sort of impacted um, by the um, the public, the sort of regime of public expenditure cuts that have been going on. So through these diagrams, we were able to show that um, the National Parks and Wildlife had experienced cuts of about 5.5 times higher than the average across all public expenditure. Um, and we were able to also look at um, where different sources of their funding were coming from and how some of these um, financing sources might be coming um, uh, or might be in risk in the, in the future. So um, just to finish off, I'm going to talk about um, what impact that this has had. Um, so the National Biodiversity Expenditure Review provided for the first time a really detailed portrait of the distribution and allocation of finance for the conservation across the Irish public and nonprofit sectors. Um, it really worked as a catalyst for increased dialogue, particularly with the agricultural sector. They're really um, beginning to recognise that they have the potential to, to play a really major role in the conservation efforts in Ireland, which is not something I think they really truly appreciated before before they'd seen some of these figures. Um, and it led to increased engagement and interaction with different departments. It highlighted the real underfunding of the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Um, and this emphasis was very much picked up in the news um, and the critical state of this current finance. Um, it led to um, a dedicated steam, stream on conservation finance within Ireland's first National Biodiversity Conference, which took place back in February. And it really uh, acted somewhat of a, a rallying position for people to begin to talk about finance from an informed perspective. And it means to it sort of engage people and often when I present on some of the results of our findings um, you get people responding and talking about different um, financing mechanisms and funding sources that could be could be um, introduced and we also have some promises of um, increases increases in finances in reaction so there is there's commitments from the environmental protection agency the office of public works um, the department of agriculture and um, the national parks and wildlife service um, in themselves and we also as shown on the screen we're very much um only uh, just sort of finished outlining the baseline situation uh, we still need to very much move on to the next stage which is understanding the, the finance cap through undertaking a financial needs assessment and um, the National Parks and Wildlife Service have now committed to um, really undertaking this as well. So um, I think I will, I will leave it there. Thank you very much for listening and um, I'll pass back over to Marco or Jessica. Thanks a lot, Rachel. Uh, it was really great to hear the experience from Ireland and, um, and to see that uh, actually the numbers is not everything that we need to see also the schemes, the, the, the compare them relatively to other numbers or the macroeconomic numbers and see all the results that came out of, uh, of your research. <clears throat> and that's actually, we, we always uh, explain to, to also our countries that the, the aim of collecting all this data and analyzing it is to have recommendations, to have results out of it. Um, so we are moving now to the Q&A session. 
I see Ono actually answer to a lot of the uh, question, which is great. Thanks a lot, Ono. Uh, just for you to understand also a little who is talking. Uh, so Ono is the manager of the Biofin uh, Globo, uh, of uh, the Biofin project. So for the questions, um, Ono answered a lot of the questions. So please feel free to write again some questions maybe that were not answered that I might have missed. Um, when is um, a BER required? I'm saying. Let me just. Um, well, actually, we we are saying that the BER should uh, should be done in a, in all the countries, and um, if you follow the biofin methodology, the aim was will be to have those results that Rachel just presented in the in the in the last uh, slide, which which is the improving the finance and the biodiversity uh, outcome uh, in the country. Um, maybe now and Rachel, could you tell us what was the the motivation for the country to do this BER? Maybe Rachel, um, could you tell us what was the the motivation from your country to start with that? Um, yeah, so um, very much um, to to sort of start thinking much more strategically, I say I would say would be the the primary motivation. Um, National Parks and Wildlife Services is, is quite a small department. Um, so it was a real chance to um, to sort of think and get for the first time a very comprehensive and detailed understanding of the flows of conservation finance in Ireland. I think that was very much their primary motivation. Great, thanks. I'm going to switch to the other question, and I see a lot of the people actually writing about that, and I also during the webinar, what is CPEIR? Um, so um, if I'm not mistaken, it's climate um, and poverty, environmental. Uh, Review, um, it's an institution review, expenditure and sorry, climate, uh, climate and poverty, expenditure uh, and institutional review. So it's it's another uh, methodology that was developed by another program, um, not by Biofin. Uh, Biofin took some parts of these tools uh, to make something more specific to biodiversity and to bring out of these uh, reviews actually requ uh, recommendations and leading to finance solutions. So you can find CPEIR uh, on the net if you're interested. Uh, feel free to take a look. But it's it's another program who developed this, um, and we took some part of these tools uh, from from this program. Um, let me look at other questions. Um, has Biofin ever been used at municipal, municipal, local, governmental level uh, to prove to subnational and national government that funding should be directed to the municipal? Uh, for buyers. Uh, so I published uh, now from Leslie Adams, uh, who I saw was really interested on in seeing how a country can join. Uh, but I thanks a lot, Ono, for answering all these questions. Um, so yes, it was, uh, Biofin is being implemented at municipal and local level in certain countries. Um, we start at the national level, but then also we have uh, some countries who started at national level and then moved to municipal level, like Philippines is also implementing some of the biofin methodology at the local level uh, in the province of Mindoro. Um, and uh, you can still have actually municipal impact uh, if you look, if you work at the national level. Um, uh, like, for example, what I was explaining from Guatemala when we saw that municipality indeed were not spending enough for biodiversity finance. Um, one of the recommendations was to develop mechanisms to support the municipality to, to finance more biodiversity. Uh, actually, I'm going to ask now, Rachel, um, did, did you have some recommendation coming coming out from your your exercise that would support this municipal work? Or were you, did you receive a lot of uh, interest from the municipality on it? Or could you tell us a little more about that? Um, yeah, so we, we very much try to um, engage with the local authority um, level um, during the review, um, there was a, a question, I suppose, um, of time and resources to to engage at that level. Um, so we often sort of went for the sort of major grant funding sort of streams that were for biodiversity conservation at that level. So in our case, this was some sort of it's an EU funding called um, uh, Agenda 21. There's a sort of a leader funding stream. So they were it was quite easy to understand sort of at, at the grant level what be, what funds were being available down there. But it was much more difficult to engage um, each local authority. And I think it would be like you said much more powerful to have them undertake it um, uh, themselves each local authority to, to 
to really understand the scale of the problem um, and on what, how the flows of finances are really helping. Um, so I think that we were able to engage with a lot of sort of biodiversity officers, but um, in terms of getting a, a much more detailed picture at the local authority, that, that wasn't something we were able to do. But interestingly, one of the, um, the financial commitments that came out of um, the focus on finance um, over the last few uh, years um, was very much a commitment to fund local authorities much more in terms of uh, providing more staff for them to engage with biodiversity. So um, yeah, that, that would be my, my, my um, insight on, on that area. Uh, great, thanks. Um, one question uh, I see, and actually it would be great also to, to have your point of view on that, Rachel. Um, I see that uh, some people are interested in working with the private sector on data. And actually, maybe I didn't say enough, but the, the, the analyzing and collecting the data from private sector is actually quite complicated. Most of all, first thing is actually, uh, you were uh, talking about that also, Rachel, is these people, uh, I mean, people from the private sector often don't know also what is biodiversity exactly. What's the difference between biodiversity and environment? And when you have to come and explain about coefficients, they might get lost. So actually, one main thing where we're recommending really to work on private sector for expenditure is, first of all, to engage with them. Uh, this will allow you maybe to find some possibilities, some recommendations for later. In Seychelles, it helped for possibility on, uh, around um, CSR and ecotourism. So there are possibilities that can come out from this private sector analysis. You might not, it's going to be extremely hard to have expenditures from all the private sector countries, um, uh, sorry, from all the private sector in the country, almost impossible. But you, there are, uh, because you were asking which methodology and resources are there, in the workbook um, uh, that you can find now, uh, that you can find online, we actually explain how some of the countries found it. And the, the, the positive things of, of the Biofin methodology is that it's adaptable to the situation. So each country did it in a different way. Costa Rica went to see the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, in Sri Lanka, they went to see the Central Bank. Um, in um, Guatemala, they did uh, a questionnaire. They invite them also to a workshop. In Seychelles, they invite them, the biggest private sector companies affecting better city to a workshop, which was mainly tourism. So there are a lot of different ways. You shouldn't look for a perfect uh, data set for private sector that will take you eight years and will have difficulties to have results out of it, but try to first engage with them, see if there is some interest, if there are possibilities. And usually once they're engaged, they want to go on uh, with, uh, with some possibilities to, 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 to actually invest or finance uh, biodiversity. But uh, Rachel, I saw you had data on private sector. Could you tell us a little more of um, how hard it was to, see the, the, to collect the data? How did you do? Uh, and what did, were you happy with the results at? We managed to collect some some data on the private sector. Um, we uh, ended up using uh, multiple different sort of um, routes to try and get some of this data. So, um, in some sense, you can um, find data through match funding. Often, um, in large projects, there can be um, companies in, in private sector that are, that are engaging with sort of large restoration projects or awareness projects that are going on with other partners. So you can sort of incidentally capture some of this um, finance um, and, and sort of that gives you a bit more of an impression about who might be interested in which are some of the players who are actively getting involved in this um, this sector. Um, CSR, as you mentioned, was was our other sort of major way of, of finding um, conservation finance from the public sector as um, the private sorry the private sector really like to publicize um, what when they're making CSR donations and when they're doing good work so that sort of adds in your favor in terms of finding finding um, out about these Ireland is, is more quite a small country so maybe we were um, at a little bit of a, an advantage there we also have a really active active um, Natural Capital Forum um, and an organization called um, Business um, in the Community, which was really, really helpful because they already have a very sort of business focused outlook and were able to sort of um, distribute and, and capture information from us in terms of, of which organizations in the pub in the private sector were sort of engaging with CSR. But um, are very much um, our, our findings were limited to sort of the match funding area, um, proactive sort of um, CSR payments. And we also engaged with the central bank to sort of to see if check and if anything else was, was going on beyond um, beyond that. 
and um, it's not a, a perfect data set, but it's um, sort of a platform from I think from which to to start thinking about it, and then and uh, some a sort of a platform from which to to improve in the future. Great, thanks, Hello, Marco. Yes, Hello, now Marco, I think yeah, I can come in now. I think uh, in terms of private sector, as uh, I mentioned earlier. There were a lot of challenges for us to understand the sector spending on biodiversity. Uh, but if you talk to some of the private sector, they do not spend because they lack ideas. So if you look at their information, they are mostly coarse and very difficult to analyze. But nevertheless, I think you also touched up on some of the opportunities. If you discuss with private sectors, I think you can come up with a lot of uh, innovative financing solutions, uh, you know, uh, especially how they can come up with new ideas. And that links to Robert's next question, how, you know, if we can give them project ideas based on NBSAP actions and all, I think uh, we need to have this continued dialogue. So there are opportunities, uh, but now the information is quite uh, very vague and coarse. Great, thank you so much. Now, uh, thanks again for for giving also your your experience on that. Um, one question uh, I can see also: What are the common barriers for implementation of biodiversity budget related? Um, I think uh, if I'm not misunderstanding the question, you're asking uh, why are some of the budget not fully uh, delivered? Um, so related to the difference I was talking about between budget allocation and expenditures. Uh, please tell me if I if I if I misunderstood Fidele. Um, so actually, here I would like to hear from Ireland. Uh, did you have a lot of difference between budget and expenditures? Were you able to 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 look at that? And if you had a lot of experience, could you explain what were the barriers to the, the these expenditures from the budget? As you mentioned, we found that allocation data was was much more difficult to get hold of. So we have a much more incomplete picture of it. But where we were able to get allocation data um, for for budgets, it was really um, proved very valuable, um, and um, it it proved quite insightful in terms of um, how big the allocation of funding was and, and how um, little was actually being spent. Now, this was particularly um, true in Ireland in the marine sector. So, as I mentioned in my presentation, we have a very low marine spend um, in in the conservation. Um, recorded um, through the review, um, just 1.3% of, of all total spending. Um, but when we talked to some of the, of the, the Marine Institute um, and some of the other organisations involved in, in distributing public sector funding for, um, for biodiversity in the marine sector, um, they were really, really struggling to get um, to, to distribute this finance because they were struggling with uptake. So they couldn't, they had the finance, but they, they really couldn't um, engage um, with uh, the fishing, fishing communities to get them to really um, apply for these, these grants um, and so forth. So a lot of the, the barrier was actually um, between the public and the, and the private sector in, in that case, in terms that they were trying to, to get them involved in, in reducing bycatch, um, to getting them involved in sort of um, these new schemes around um, landing obligations um, for fisheries, um, uh, sort of different types of, of catch reduction and bycatch reduction as well, a new, new use of sort of gear and stuff. And they, they literally couldn't spend the money, it seemed to be the impression. So um, yeah, it was it was really quite revealing when you, when you did get this this allocation data as to how much more needed to be done, and whether this was an opportunity for the National Parks and Wildlife Service to really um, engage and help um, in, in sort of improve and try to improve this allocation, um, sort of this um, sort of the spending that was coming through some of these marine sectors. So yeah, where where we were able to get it, it was incredibly valuable, but it was incredibly quite quite hard for us to get really in, in the end. Thanks a lot, Rachel. Yes, indeed, it's, a, it's also in most of our countries, we saw that it's a big issue to try to have it, but every time we had it, we could see some actually opportunities that were amazing on just, okay, this money is actually there, we can find a way to spend it. And just by building or building the, maybe the infrastructure that is needed, the structure the in the, in the fund or in the team that is there building the capacity, we could actually already finance biodiversity without creating new, innovative, completely brand new mechanism that takes seven years to, 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 to create. Actually, just by looking into this type of data, you can find opportunities. That we're going to close for now this webinar. Thanks a lot for all this question.
but the question is not answered, will be answered uh, later in the in the forum. We will try to, to address them. Uh, please feel free to write them again in the in the course room, in the forum of the course room, if, if we forget and if you need an answer to something. Um, our team will be happy to answer. I will encourage Nawang and Rachel, please, to take a look at the forum uh, that is on the course room and um, answer the questions you might be able to answer. And to the participants, please, uh, if you have the occasion to have these, uh, these speakers, these people that uh, actually implemented in the country. So please feel free to, to, to ask questions and, and um, uh, I mean, to, to, to these speakers. I would like to thank a lot, uh, Rachel and Nawang, for these great presentations and uh, for sharing the, the experience from your country. You will be, um, the, the, the participants will be able to download the presentations today directly from the course room, by the way. And um, we hope to see you in the next webinar next week, which will be on the financial needs assessment, another big piece of uh, Biofin uh, methodology. And um, with that, I will say thanks, everybody. Talk to you in the course room and uh, see you maybe in the next webinar next week. <laughs>